What we have for our last session for today is, as you can see from our screen here, is, um, and I'm going to unmute, yes. There you go, Kendra, we can see you. Um, we have a, a um, off-site guest with us this afternoon. Um, this is Kendra Morgan. She is from Web Junction, um, and she is actually out, are you in Seattle right now? I am in Seattle, yes. Yes, she's in Seattle, wasn't able to come here today to be with us, but she is going to talk to us now about um, Web Junction and Tech Atlas for Libraries, a, source, a resource in Web Junction that you can use to do all this tech planning stuff that we've been talking about um, this um, today, this afternoon. So um, I am going to hand it over to you, and you are good to go, Kendra. All right, thanks so much, Krista. I am sorry I couldn't be with you all. It was a bit of a conflict this week, um, but I hope that everything is going well. It sounded like you had some great sessions lined up, so I hope that all went uh, really smoothly for day one. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Tech Atlas for Libraries. I think you know in the previous session you heard about all the stuff that goes into your technology plan and, and how to do that successfully. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Tech Atlas for Libraries, which is a free resource that's made available through Web Junction. And it's a tool that some of you may be familiar with if you did the Gates Foundation's Opportunity Online grant. You may have used Tech Atlas to complete an inventory. And the tool continues to be available for anyone to use, both for technology planning and for inventory management purposes. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can use some of those features in Tech Atlas. And my face is just going to go away for a little while. I'm going to move back to a live uh, demo of Tech Atlas in a little bit. So I'll pull the, the webcam back up when we get there. So some of the things that we're going to cover today are, are how to access and log in to the account, uh, navigating through the technology planning features. And then we're also going to look at some of the other tools that are in Tech Atlas that are available to you, including how to create an inventory and how to use Event Tracker, which is a kind of like a help desk tool that you have access to um, as part of the inventory, and it can be helpful for keeping track of problems and issues as well as solutions to technology problems in the library that you might be able to use in the future as a bit of a knowledge base. So I know that there is a chat window, and I do have it open, so if anything comes up as I'm going through, do feel free to, to put in your questions. I'll also have some time at the end to address those as well, but this will be pretty informal. Uh, so if you have anything along the way that you'd like me to clarify, don't hesitate to put that in or, or hang on to your question for the end, and we'll make sure we get it answered. So just a quick overview about Tech Atlas. It is a free service of Web Junction, and it's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's a free service to libraries, and it includes all the tools, including uh, technology planning, inventory management, uh, and uh, the grant management and reporting tools that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if many libraries already have a Tech Atlas account, so you may not need to create one. You can feel free to get in touch with me after the session if you think maybe your library does have an account. I can work to get you connected to that. So when we talk about Tech Atlas as a planning tool, one of the things that I like to emphasize to people is that it's really just part of the solution when you're, when you're looking, at, at, looking at it as a planning tool. So you can have your car, but without the gas and the map, and the time, and a destination, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So when it comes to technology planning, so much of the content that you heard in the previous session is really critical, and that's the meat of, of your planning process. And you need to have all of those things in order to use the planning feature in Tech Atlas. And so it's really, um, I often liken it to a container to help organize your information, and you'll see how it's uh, broken down when we get into the live demo. And so the website for accessing Tech Atlas is webjunction.techatlas.org. And I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a live demo now. And I'll pull the, uh, the webcam back up. OK. So I'm going to go ahead and log into the account. And so this is my Tech Atlas for Libraries account. It has several tabs here at the top. There's a planning tab, uh, an survey tab, inventory, and tools and reports. 
we'll kind of start at the top and move our way across. And so when we go into the planning section, um, this is where you would actually build a technology plan. And like I said, you really have to have a lot of the information that's important for putting a technology plan together for this to be successful. Um, so we're going to start by looking at the plan year section. And the way that this works is that you can choose to have as many plant years in your technology plan as possible, as you would like rather, and you can deactivate the years. And this is specifically connected to the budget portion of Tech Atlas. Um, but these dates that I put in also show up at the top of your technology plan when you print it out. But if I wanted to, I could have had three, four, five years worth of budget info in here that I would just hide um, by deactivating. So if I click that, it makes the year 2010 inactive in my budget section. What you'll notice throughout is wherever it's applicable, there's an E-rate applicant tip. And so one of the things that we've tried to do here is that whenever there's a tip that's important for E-rate applicants to know, we've tried to include those details. So in this case, the tip is to make sure that you're explicit about what the plan year length is. Um, they've had some issues with people in the past who've just put you know, an, a year on their plan, 2011, and without the specificity saying what dates it's covered, it's caused some issues where people um, uh, there have been questions about what the actual time period was supposed to be. So um, in my work as an E-rate coordinator, I've always recommended that people put the write out the dates very explicitly. So that tip is included here. And there's also a help option if you ever, as you're going through and you need little help tips. Um, our, I um, monitor the Tech Atlas help box as well as one of my colleagues. And we're pretty accessible and available. One of the things that's pretty nice about Tech Atlas is that we can make corrections and changes to information pretty quickly. So if you ever find a mistake or something that you have a question about, just fire me off an email and I can usually get back to you pretty quickly and figure out uh, what's going on. So anything that you go through and, and you have a question, you can feel free to reach out to me and I'll make sure you have my email address at the end. The team section is um, one of the things that I've always uh, kind of been a proponent of is people who work on a, a technology plan together uh, to help kind of cover all the bases. And, you know, it really is something that can work for libraries of all sizes, even smaller rural libraries. Um, instead of being solely responsible for writing the plan, if you have a board member who has an interest in technology or a local business person who might have some some knowledge uh, or someone that you rely on as a consultant, you can work with multiple people on putting this together and Tech Atlas allows you to save the information uh, on who's on your team and you can actually email the uh, draft plan to them for review is one of the options that you have available to you. You'll also notice that there are links whenever it's relevant as well to articles back on Web Junction that might be helpful to help to clarify some of the topics that are available here. And so there is an, an article on building a technology team and how to do that successfully, what, uh, what to look out for, and some tips for, for doing uh, working with a technology team. So that's a link back to that article. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, you see a lot of these are really just fill in the blank boxes. So I mentioned very early on that this was like a container to hold the information. So it kind of takes some of the guesswork out of formulating um, the layout because at the end you'll be able to download the plan into a Microsoft Word document that you can edit and adjust as you need to. But it keeps things pretty organized, which is nice. Your mission and vision are optional items. Um, sometimes they're nice because it helps to give people who, who maybe um, who didn't write the plan or who aren't as familiar with the library, if you have new staff coming in and you want them to be able to read your technology plan, having things in there like your mission and vision statement help to pull everything together. Um, so that's one, another option. And these are very simple. They're just text boxes that you can update by using the Save button here. And then we'll move over to the, the uh, the meat <laughs> of your technology plan, which are the goals and objectives. So this is really where the, um, the details of your plan start coming together. And I already have some sample goals and objectives in here. Um, obviously, when you start off, it'll be a very empty page. 
but you'll have this text box where you can enter a new goal. And you just click on Add New Goal, and it will end up in your list of goals. You see it right down here at the bottom. And so when I have my goal there, I can actually do a couple of things. I can delete it if I need to, if it doesn't uh, really belong, or if I made a mistake, I can edit it and make changes to the text or I can add objectives. And so I'll go ahead and click on that Add Objectives. There's an evaluation box. And one of the things that, um, if you've ever heard the term SMART, and I don't know if it came up in the previous session, but when you write your goals and objectives using the SMART principle, which is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, that if you go back and you read your goals and objectives, you want them to fit the SMART principle. And so one of the things that is important is that measurable aspect. How will you know you're successful? So we added in a place for people to put in an evaluation component. And this could be you know, something as simple as you want to see uh, traffic to your website increase by 5% in the next year. And so you could put that goal there um, by saying, you know, exactly what does 5% look like? Um, is it 1,000 visits to your site? Is it 200? Um, that's one way to do that. And you can also put in a deadline. And these will all print out as part of your technology plan at the end. Um, there's also going to be another place where we look at how you can use evaluation to really look at the whole plan and evaluate the planning process. One layer deeper is an activity level. Um, it depends on what type of planner you are. A lot of people don't use the activity level because it's too detailed. And so it really depends on your personal preference if you want to put in activities. But you can put in very specific tasks and things that uh, need to be accomplished in order to get the goal finished. And so that's um, another feature that you can use if you want to. And I'll go back and show you an example of what that looks like. So here's an example. And in here we say we're going to replace the library's web server and software by December 2011. And the first activity that I included was to be able to define what that hardware and software looks like. So that was listed as an activity. But it's not a requirement when it comes to planning. It is a feature that's available to you in Tech Atlas if you wanted to use it. One of the things to remember about all of Tech Atlas is that it's kind of a la carte. You can take the pieces that are valuable to you and not worry about the other ones. Um, you can use all of them, you can use none of them, <laughs> whatever is most valuable to you. So the flexibility is there. So a lot of people have actually used Tech Atlas to put together their goals and objectives and write those but they do their budget somewhere else. So that's a good example. If you already do your budget in a spreadsheet or in um, you know, an Excel or you have um, software, the budgeting is done in another division or department, you don't have to do that here to be able to finish your technology plan. You can still use the features in Tech Atlas um, as you need to. So there's a great article that um, is about writing goals and objectives that was based on some work that uh, was done at the State Library of Kansas, so they have some great tips on, on writing goals and objectives as well. And again, those links just go straight back um, to resources, either um, articles or the E-Rate applicant tips. All right. There's also a place for a professional development statement. Um, generally, what I recommend people do is that if you have um, especially if you are participating in E-Rate, if there's something in your library that you're doing, you have to make sure part of the E-Rate thing is to make sure that people are trained on new technologies so that the library can use them effectively. So if there's a training requirement with some new software or hardware that you're bringing in, I usually encourage people to actually put that down as a goal or activity so that it's explicit. Um, but you can also have a general statement about your library's approach to professional development. So do you um, encourage people to take free webinars? Do you encourage people to go to things like the technology summer camp? You know, options like that are a good thing to include in this strategy and as a, a catch-all statement. And again, sometimes we have to think about the content that goes into the technology plan uh, as something that's going to be read by someone who isn't completely familiar with the way they operate, with the way the library operates, they 
could be new. A board members sometimes don't understand some of the nuances. So you want to make sure that you you are writing um, in some cases so that other people can understand it, not just the person who wrote it. And sometimes statements like this can be helpful in that scenario. Um, but it's not required. It's just an option. The budget, which really everyone's favorite thing, right? Nothing like trying to figure out how you're going to pay for everything. <laughs> So there are a couple of ways that you can budget in Tech Atlas. And you can either budget at the objective level, which is by far the most popular, or at the activity level. And remember I said a lot of people often don't budget at the activity level or don't put in activities just because they're not, um, they're generally a little too detailed for most people. But if you budget at the objective level, which is most common, you get the chance to create budget categories and funding sources. So these are how you want to organize the budget that's available to you or that you're uh, planning to use. So in this case, I've created three uh, funding categories, hardware, software, and staffing. And I've created five funding sources. And so these are just examples of what those funding sources might look like. You can put in anything that you want that would be practical or that would apply to your library situation. You can change these at any time, um, even if you've gone in and you've already started doing your budgeting. If you re realize that there are a few other areas that you would like to add in, it's never too late to go back and make that adjustment. So go ahead and open up um, an example of what the budget worksheet looks like. I think I need to stretch this out just a little bit. I'll cover that up a bit. Um, and so back at the beginning, I showed you, and I'll just switch back here real quickly. But the plan year, the only year that's active here is 2011. Um, if I make 2010 active, I'll just show you in the worksheet that now we have two columns, 2010, 2011, the category and the source of funds. So you'll see that here are all of my goals and then the four uh, for objectives that I had associated with that. And if I edit this, go ahead and click on the edit button in the spreadsheet, I can go ahead and, and enter in um, all of the details for the budget. So let's see, here's like, so here's a, one that's simple, right? Install virus protection software on every, any, every computer. And so I'm gonna say that in uh, 2011, that's gonna cost me $225, and I'm going to pay for it um, with local funds. That's pretty straightforward, and it's just a drop-down menu. These are the, the categories that you set up on the, on the previous page, and then the funding sources as well. So they can all be edited and changed, and let's see, we'll go, and this is the sample one that I created, so I'll go ahead and put in just as an example. All right. I go back up and save the page. And now I can pull up an example on um, the budget summary. So this is a, uh, a page summary that shows me um, what it essentially look like when I uh, print out this um, the budget. So I've got $13,000 uh, in 2010 and $225 in 2011. And it also shows me where um, I have allocated my funds. So I've got $10,000 in hardware in 2010, $225 in software in 2011. So it's broken down and organized to help you see the categories that you've used. And again, if you already use a budgeting software in your library and this isn't, um, this is just duplicating your work, there'd be no point in doing it because you can just print out what you've already done and attach it. The thing that's important is just to, to be flexible with it and understand what's going to help you do your job more effectively. And that's, and that's what we try to, to do and, and show people are some tools that, that might help them um, in their work and make things a little bit easier. So There's also a general, I mentioned the ability to do an evaluation at the objective level, which is a really great idea to help remind you about the what's required to understand if things are successful. And, and what I have found over the years is that some people are very hesitant to put in specifics about evaluation 
because they're concerned about what happens when they don't reach those goals. And one of the things that I think is very true about the technology and, and really any of the goals that we set up is that if you don't um, kind of do a debrief or understand what made something successful or perhaps made it not successful even more importantly, um, we either get ourselves in a situation where we repeat the same mistakes or we avoid doing things that could potentially be really beneficial because of a lack of understanding. Um, I think one of my least favorite things is um, when people say, oh, we tried that, it didn't work, but they can't articulate what it was that didn't work. It's just kind of got this legacy feeling um, in some places where, like, oh, those things just don't work if we do them. And what you really want to be able to understand was, was it a lack of budget? Did people, you know, did you have a major staff change? Did it turn out that the community just wasn't interested in it, even though you did um, a great campaign around encouraging, for example, usage of a certain resource? Um, but being able to really understand what didn't work is, is just as helpful. And so putting in evaluations can be a very valuable step in, in understanding how to most effectively spend the library's time um, and resources in the future. So I think it's a good idea even when it's a little painful sometimes. <laughs> there also, this, this is just a place that we added at the request of, uh, I see this has been a long time since I've been in this stage, um, at the request of one of the state libraries that we work with, they wanted um, all of their libraries to be able to put their um, policies that were related to computing in a single place. And um, they were able to upload, you can upload a PDF or a Word document, or you can just put in a link to say, yep, we've got an updated internet use policy. Um, this is uh, an example here um, that we've linked to. And it's just a way to say, oh, yeah, we've got all these things. We've updated it recently. Um, or it might draw attention to the fact that a policy hasn't been updated recently. This does not get included in the technology plan. So no worries about whether or not you use this at all. The download technology plan is where you would actually print out or download a copy to your computer of the technology plan that you've created in Tech Atlas. And this is an example of what it looks like. So this is just the HTML version. This is the inventory. We're going to talk about that next. And everything that's included there um, in your inventory can get included here. And then here are the goals and objectives that are broken down um, that we looked at earlier. So there's lots of information that you can use. And what I really encourage people to do is that once they've downloaded the technology plan, is that you can continue to edit it and make it change the font, change the layout a little bit, but the content is, is really there, which is helpful. Um, one of, for example, one of the things I always like to see added is a kind of recent history update. If you show, you know, this is what's happened in the last three years in the library. We got a new automation system. We bought all new computers. Something, again, when you keep in mind that the person who's reading it may not know um, things that have happened in the recent past having a little summary statement is always a useful um, thing to include at the top, but there isn't a field for that in Tech Atlas. So it's important that you continue to customize the technology plan as you feel fit or necessary, even after it's downloaded in Tech Atlas. The only downside is you can't upload those back to the site. So any changes that you make offline uh, will stay um, on your local computer, and the changes won't be able to be pushed up to Tech Atlas. So one down bed. All right, so that um, is the technology planning section. So you can see here's the link to download it into Word format, or if you don't have Word, you can also don't download it as a uh, rich text format. So you can use it in a different application if you need to. So those, both of those options are there. And I'm looking, it doesn't look like there are any questions, but do feel free to put those in as we go along. And I'm going to move over to the inventory section now, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to include those. Okay, so the next major section that I want to cover is the inventory, and this is probably even more so than than the technology planning is probably what people use Tech Atlas for most often. Um, because we've been using this in conjunction with Gates Foundation grants, it's been used by thousands of libraries, so it's seen a lot of use and 
a lot of people will use it for one of the grant reporting requirements and they'll continue using Tech Atlas and you are welcome to do the same. Um, if it's of interest to you and valuable to your library, we're happy that it's available. So the most popular thing that people inventory are their computers and software. So I'm going to show you an example of what it looks like to do this inventory. Um, it can be really simple and very quick, um, or it can get a little bit more complicated. So we'll kind of look at a range of options. So what we're looking at now is just an overview of the inventory for my uh, fictional library, the main library. And then I have an East Lake branch. And these are details about all the computers that I have in my inventory. And those locations were created here. So you'll see here's a library locations link at the top of the inventory. And I've got um, my main library and the East Lake Library. And you can add in as many locations as you need to. Um, some people also use the inventory feature as a way to break up their buildings. So they'll say, you know, first floor, they'll say children's room, uh, genealogy room. So you can do it in whatever way makes the most sense. So if you have a particularly large library, it may be really helpful for you to actually break things up by rooms if you want to. So any, uh, any setup that works for you will, will generally work in here in terms of setting up your library location. So you can, you can certainly customize that as you need to. I've got it set up to use by branches. And these are the computers that I've inventoried. So here's a couple of things that you should know. So this inventory computers button takes you to a page with several uh, inventory options that are available to you. So the local inventory tool works on practically any Windows-based PC. Um, it has Windows-based PCs have a feature in them called the Windows Management Instrumentation that has information stored on it about your live about the computer and the tool can work with that file to collect uh, information about the manufacturer of the computer, how much memory is there, how much hard drive space you have, what applications are installed. So it's really uh, valuable and it's very quick. The local inventory tool collects a really comprehensive inventory in under a minute for a computer. And so you don't have to sit and try and figure out what the information is. Um, the downside is is that it only works with Windows PCs. So if you have Macintosh or Linux or Unix, you're going to have to use a different option. But the, um, the local tool is great if you have um, a Windows PC. Um, we've seen it be a little spotty with Internet Explorer 8. I was glad when they came out with 9 because it seemed to have fixed a lot of the issues. Um, there are just some settings that you may have problems with if you um, use it with IE8, but there's a link to how to to work around any of those problems. The network inventory tool is very similar to the local tool in that it also works on Windows PCs. Um, the difference is that it's designed to crawl your network and look for computers that have the same administrative username and password. And so it will go at once and try and find as many computers. And so it's, if they're on the same domain, or they're part of the same work group, this tool will work. The biggest problem that we see with the network tool is that if your library has a firewall, which is generally a good idea, <laughs> um, but if the firewall is preventing computers within the library from talking with each other, this tool will, will often um, have problems communicating with other computers, trying to collect the information because the firewall is protecting the system. and um, if the machines don't all have the same administrative username and password, you could have a problem. When it does work, um, it can be great. It can be a great time saver. You could do 100 computers in an hour, and they'd all be inventoried, and all you have to do is click a button. Um, all of the information in both the local tool and the network tool are stored on your computer. You don't, um, it doesn't install any software on your computer when you run these tools. Everything is, um, it's just a little file. Like I said, it's been run thousands of times at this point. Um, but it doesn't actually install anything on your machine. It just collects the information, allows you to review it. And then when um, you approve what's being uploaded to Tech Atlas, you have the ability to click on an upload button to send the results uh, to the server where it's stored. So you get to control what gets sent. And it doesn't install anything on your machine, which is which is nice. 
Um, so those are options that are available to you if you use uh, a Windows-based PC. Any non-Windows-based PC or anyone who actually prefers to use just a, a manual web form, we've tried to keep things as flexible as possible. Um, we know that not everything works perfectly, so if you wanted to do something very quick and simply, this online form is a really um, easy way to do that. So here's an example if you had a Macintosh computer. You would just click on the Mac option, and I would put in um, the name of the machine, the operating system, and I'm going to say this is OS 10. It's, a pub it's not a public access machine. I just got it this year, and I didn't get it with grant funds. This feature, the grant funds probably won't show up on your machine. It's part of my account. A little bit further down the page are some options that are optional options. So the top part is required. That's all the information that you need in order to create the inventory in Tech Atlas, those, those fields at the top. But you could choose, if you wanted to, to put in more detail. So I could say that this is a, um, it's a workstation. Um, and I could say what the CPU speed was. Um, And I could put in information like how much I paid for it, when does the warranty expire. I could put in work notes here if I wanted to. So you can choose how much information you want to put in. It's up to you if you want to include the serial number, anything like that. What you'll be able to do later is download a spreadsheet that has all the information in it. So it's really helpful. Um, one of the things that's happened, I know, on several occasions is people have called me you know, they have an inventory in Tech Atlas, and unfortunately, through either a disaster or some kind of um, mischief, they've had problems with their computers being stolen, whatever, and they've used their Tech Atlas inventory as um, a proof of um, possession or uh, proof for their insurance agent to uh, to file their claim. So that's unfortunately that's always disaster planning is always one of the best reasons to have an, an accurate, up to date inventory of of your computers. So it is uh, something to pay attention to, and you can put as much information in here as I said you want to. I'm going to go ahead and save this, and I'll show you an example. Um, this is a computer that I inventory using the Windows. Um, the local inventory tool. So it automatically, and so again, this is only Windows-based PCs, but it grabbed all the information for me. It's telling me that it's a Gateway E4300, um, and it shows me the um, details about the operating system, how much hard drive space, and this is all information that's available on the computer. It's just sometimes a lot of work to pull it all together. So by using the, the local inventory tool, um, you can quickly do that. Um, and there are some places here to put in additional information and edit as well about the price that you paid, when the warranty expires, things like that. Um, you can also add work notes here that might be valuable. Um, this is a case where I've customized a field. This is the asset tag. So if your library has asset tags on all of your equipment, um, in the profile, and I'll show you this in a bit, um, in the profile, you can customize two of the fields so that you can um, choose to, to title them anything that you want. Um, asset tag is a pretty common one that people use. Okay. Go ahead and back. And again, this is an example of, of information that was collected with the automated inventory tools. You also have the option to do this you know, with your peripherals, which is probably the second most common thing. So if you want to inventory all the peripherals that are part of your library, the same thing applies where you can put them at a location like the main library um, or your branch library and have a, an accurate, up-to-date inventory of all of those items as well. OK, so the next thing that I want to show you is uh, something that's connected to the inventory, and it's the event tracker tool. Let's grab a sip of water. And so event tracker is a resource that it's a really simple help desk. So a lot of times, um, you know, even if you're just a, a, a small library, maybe you have some volunteers, um, 
sometimes keeping track of the problems on computers and paying attention to um, things getting fixed and repaired, or if you have someone who comes in and volunteers to do work on the computers and you want an easy way to keep track of the requests to that person, um, the event tracker is an easy way that you can do that. So this is set up now to, um, it's connected with the inventory, and you'll see here in this issue with con, there's a public one, child one, the circulation computer. These are names of machines that are in my inventory. So I'm going to click on this option here. Actually, let me go down a little bit. I'm going to show you some features. So the way that Event Tracker usually works is that when someone creates an event, and there are a couple of ways that you can do this, you'll notice down here there are several links. And so this one is for my main library, and this one is for East Lake. What I would do is at the main library, I would copy this link and provide it to the staff in that library. And it could be that I put it on my intranet, or I put it as a shortcut um, in their favorites, or on the desktop. And then anytime there's a problem with the computer, or any computer in the library, or peripheral, um, the staff member volunteer would click on that link and fill out a form, which is basically a ticket saying something is wrong with the computer. And what would happen is that an email notification would go to the person designated to track those problems. So I'm going to show you an example of what the form looks like. So here's the form. And here's an example. I actually put this note in here. I was working with another library to get their um, system, their Tech Atlas system up and running. So I still have their uh, their examples in here for the Emporia Public Library. But I'm going to go ahead and pretend I'm just creating this uh, a problem. So I'm going to say that there's a problem with the checkout one machine. And the problem is, um, we'll say it's hardware. And uh, the DVD drive is stuck and won't open. And I'm going to say, my username and where I want to receive an update. So this is uh, this is what I would fill out as a staff member, and this is what I would see. And so if I send this, it goes into the system. It lets me know that it was successfully submitted. And when I go back into Tech Atlas, what would happen now is that um, the person who is responsible for monitoring the events just got an email. Um, Actually, it's me <laughs> for this account. I um, got an email saying a, a problem has been reported that needs to be looked at. And there's a little description. So I'm going to refresh this page because that new ticket. So here's the ticket that just came in um, on 8.22. And it says the DVD drive is stuck and open. You'll notice below here um, there are green additions to some of these um, entries. And a green addition is something that someone's written as part of the resolution, as part of the fix to the problem. So I'm going to go ahead and view this problem. And so this is what I get to see as the administrator. So I see the description of the problem. Um, I can choose whether or not it should be resolved. And what I can do is to actually put in detail. So here I can say that uh, I went and I looked at the computer, and then I came back to Tech Atlas, and I said um, there was gum in the drive, <laughs> because I've actually seen that happen. I'm sure a few of you have as well. Cleaned, and all is fixed. So if I update that, and I'm going to say it's resolved, and go ahead and update that. And it's taking me back to the page, and I can see There's the, the resolution that I just put in. So I can actually sort up here from the last updated. And there's my resolution. So it's keeping track of the problem. So something else, what, what ends up happening is that you can do things, um, say the problem was a lot more complex, um, you, can, you can add in additional details. And the hope here is that it starts to become a list of uh, knowledge-based items that are specific to your computer to help you better understand 
problems that might be happening um, with the computer. So we'll go ahead and say um, followed instructions at So this is an example of something that you could put in if you found um, some troubleshooting tips online when you're helping to look for the problem. And then you can put those notes in the record for the event so that in the future when you're looking, um, you can see if the same problem occurs again, you'll have a quick link to those fixes. The other thing that's actually handy as well is that it starts to pull attention to machines that are problem children. <laughs> So if it's the same computer, if you get to the end of the year and it's time to replace the machine and you notice that one of them has had problems 15 times, this can be a very quick way um, to prioritize which computer should be replaced first. So you can sort by the, um, the computer name and be able to see, or, or um, in this case there's peripherals as well, but if in this case I've got two problems with public one, if that list was really long, it could be that there's just that that computer is acting up so much that it's not worth keeping it around um, or the time that it's been taking you to maintain them. So that's something that, that's two ways that you can use it really is to, um, to find knowledge-based items within your own um, computer or um, using it as a way to help prioritize replacements in the future. So I mentioned that um, someone's designated to receive those emails whenever there's a problem, and the way that you do that, so I'm going to go to the profile here, and it's always a link in the upper right-hand corner of your Tech Atlas account. And so if I go to the profile, here is where you put in the uh, tech consultant. So these, both of these email addresses have received copies of the problem that I just reported because um, they were both listed. So you can have as many people listed as you want. We do get a lot of questions from people about whether or not multiple logins are allowed for Tech Atlas. The answer is no. You can only have one login. So we usually recommend that people pick, you know, whoever's email address you use to log in and then pick a, a password that you're both comfortable with and then share that, that username and password with anyone else who needs to access the Tech Atlas account. Um, when we did the inventory, I mentioned that some people like to customize fields. And this is one of the places where you can do that, or this is the place where you would do that. So I mentioned asset tag was really um, an important one. Um, and so this can be blank. It doesn't have to be there. The field will still be there, but the name of it will we'll just say user-defined field 2. Um, important to know about your Tech Atlas account, just while we're in here, is that you can change the um, username and password on your account at any time. Um, the next time you log in, you just want to use that, but the username and passwords can be changed at any time. So if, if your library has an account, someone's left and needs to take over, it's fine to go ahead and change that. There are no restrictions there. All right. Go back. Just going to pull the event tracker back up again. You can also, as the administrator, when you're in Tech Atlas, you don't have to use that web-based form. So I mentioned this. Um, if you had multiple branches, you would want to uh, use these links to help uh, sort the uh, event tracker request to each library, because then the, the computers that they see in the drop-down option are the ones that have been inventoried and installed at their library. So. You want to make sure you do that when it's applicable. Um, but you can also, some people just like to do it to monitor their workflow and, and what they've been doing. So you can, as an individual, keep track of that um, just by clicking on Add New Event. And it's almost identical to the form that you saw um, that, the, that the staff would use um, in a branch or in a library very simple um, web-based form that you would fill in and just click on Save. And in this case, the only difference is that no email is sent because you're logged into the account. So the nice thing is um, 
if you have lots of staff, they don't need your Tech Atlas login information in order to be able to report on a problem. They can just use those links uh, and then they fill in their information. Um, anyone else who is using the Tech Atlas account and logging in who has the username and password could use that link that's provided below or they can use this Add New Event button. So that is Tech Atlas in a nutshell. Um, there are uh, about 10 minutes left for questions, and I'd be happy to answer any of those. If you would like to text chat anything, um, I'd be happy to answer. Um, if there's anything I can help clarify. Thank you very much, Kendra. Uh, that's a lot of information, of course, but like you said, it's a nice overview of it. Um, we have three remote locations logged in, and we have people here in the room. Does anybody have any questions for Kendra about Tech Atlas or about Web Junction? Um, yes. Okay, the question is, if you have a Web Junction account, is Tech Atlas automatically part of that, or do you have to set up a separate Tech Atlas account or apply for one of those? It's a great question, and it comes up at least once a week. <laughs> um, you do need to have separate accounts. So the, the, the biggest frustration that people have, they try to fix them. You know, they're trying to use their Web Junction account to log into Tech Atlas, and it definitely won't work. So. If you set it up to use the same username and password, it would be fine, but um, chances are you are using a different one. Um, I'll show you uh, just while you're at Tech Atlas, if you think you might have ha had an account at some point, you can click on this Forgot Your Password link and just type in your email address. And if an account is found uh, in Tech Atlas, it will email you your password. And if you don't remember any of it or you think someone else had it, that contact us. Like I said, I monitor it along with my colleague, Denise, and uh, we'll get you logged in if you already have an account. You just need to let us know. Yes, we've had that happen with some libraries where um, the director has changed or the person in charge has changed, so they know there was one, but the email address is no longer the email address that the new person's using. So in that case, you get a whole new account for yourself. Exactly. exactly. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Out there? Nothing so far. <laughs> okay. Well, then I guess we don't have any urgent questions at the moment. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. You guys do know her contact information if you do want to call her about questions about it. Um, you can also contact me as well if you just want someone local. Um, I help our libraries use Tech Atlas for um, other grants as well, so um, I can help you through some of the things. Um, and her uh, slides are on your flash drives as well. She had PowerPoint slides as a backup for all of this as well, so we also have that information for your reference later. Um, anybody have anything else? While actually, I've been actually, I'll throw something in. I okay. I've used the inventory tool for just my home stuff, and now I, I was able to get away with that because I was teaching this once, so I was like, hey, I might as well inventory my home computers. Uh, it was really handy, especially pulling out those serial numbers and everything, but I, it's, yeah. sometimes I almost wish I could use the event tracker for the computers in my house, but I can't get my wife to you know, submit trouble tickets. <laughs> um, she just waits till I come home and tells me what's wrong, but um, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. okay. Oh, there is a remote question. Okay. Um, it says, wait, can we use the event tracker with patrons? So there's no reason you couldn't. So if you wanted patrons to be able to report on problems, and the nice thing is that you could set up event tracker to work. And actually, let me show you one thing real quick, because you can choose to customize the list of what people can report. So I'll just show you. Um, so by default, mine is set up to include all of the things that are in my inventory, but you can actually customize the event options here. So I'm going to click on Customize Event Options List, and I'm going to say just use um, example one, example two, example three. And now I think, I think, sometimes I do have to kind of hold my breath. Um, what should happen now is that when I pull up a new event, I have to switch to turn that on. Let's see.
oh, here, use, using customized list. So when I save this, and now I add a new event, that's all that shows up is example one, example two, example three. So if you wanted to, you could use this with your patrons and change um, what they get to see. Um, if you don't want them to see all of your inventory, and you can also, I tell you, you can create as many Tech Atlas accounts as you want. Like people have, sometimes I find they have three accounts and they've been doing different things with them, and that's really just fine with me. You can do whatever you need to to use the tools. Um, but if you want to use it with your patients, you can. I would just um, do some testing first to kind of work through the process so that it's not too overwhelming for everyone. And do you really want to be in the situation where you have to get back to patrons about technology problems? Usually, it's, you know, the staff, they'll say, oh, this isn't working. Can you, uh, and they'll just direct them to a new machine, or they'll say, we'll get it fixed by the end of the week. So just kind of be mindful of, of how you would want to manage that policy. Okay, anything else for Kendra about Tech Atlas or about Web Junction? Yes. Uh, is anybody aggregating information from Tech Atlas about problems, et cetera, that are you know, generically, statistically common? Hmm, good question. I have no idea. Uh, Kendra, is anybody aggregating information from, coming from Tech Atlas for statistics that are common, like across all libraries? No. <laughs> so you're looking for proof that you really like don't like gateways, or is this just exactly, right, exactly. <laughs> You know, sometimes I'm, I do these things, and I think I just made more work for myself because um, that's actually a really interesting question. There's no centralized knowledge base either. There's no, um, you know, this is what someone else tried um, that works successfully. But kind of a, it's an interesting idea for sure. I think there's a lot of there's so many different options with configuration that might make it problematic, but kind of I kind of like it. Might have put an idea into uh, Kendra and Web Junction's head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just going to throw in a comment here, having played with this and talked to a lot of libraries that are using it. I just want to stress what Kendra said about you know providing documentation for that one machine that just never works right? I mean, you've, you've all got the one, you keep calling, but are you actually documenting this? And this is a really good way to do that. So you can, at the end of the year, go back and say, this one computer has had problems over and over and over again, and this we need to replace this one or that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything from the outside world? Mm, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Okay, I think then um, we'll wrap that up. From Kendra, thank you very much, Kendra, for your demonstration. That was great. Um, very useful tool, like you said. Um, take a look at it. Look it up. See if you guys have an account already. Did I just change myself or not? Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Technology, isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all very much. I appreciate the chance to be here today. Thanks a lot, Kendra.